This is Cathonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Cathonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. And we're going to continue our look at uh, sort of Afro-Caribbean, South American uh, religious traditions, religious traditions that um, come out of, that really that are syncretisms of uh, ancient African religions. Uh, and today we are going to talk about Pambagira. Now, Pambagira, um, it's interesting because Pambagira is spoken of in both the singular and the plural, because uh, on the one hand, you know, She's considered to be a certain kind of messenger spirit, but also um, in, in certain uh, varieties of Afro-Brazilian religion, she's actually a type of spirit that, um, that can possess somebody. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there's, there's a, I'm, I'm thinking about how I want to approach this because there's, there's several um, background concepts that uh, are important to have, and of course we want to talk about the origins of Pambagira before we get into, um, in order to understand what her role is and where she comes from. Um, now, okay, well, first of all, I want to start with, I'm going to start with who she is and what her, her role is. Um, she's, she's part of several different religious traditions that I want to talk about each one of them at least a little bit, because I think that's important. And then to talk a little bit about what her origins are um, in the um, in the African religions and the Yoruba, and um, particularly and, and similar African religions, and of course we want to look at some of her attributes as a dark feminine figure, uh, because she is in some ways she is the quintessential dark mother or dark feminine figure. Like maybe mother might not entirely be the right word, but she is uh, you know but so but but there's but she embodies a tremendous amount of. Uh, of the the qualities that we associate with the dark feminine, and and, and it, it, I want to kind of take some time also to reflect on how this affects uh, racial attitudes as well, um, because this is a case where um, there is there is a tradition of these types of feminine figures in African religion um, that may uh, you know that may be part of you know the the what is considered to be unconsciously threatening to people. Um, and I say unconsciously because there's no con there's no conscious or rational basis for it, but this kind of um, attitude towards um, African Americans that is part of this um, systemic racial idea that we have that we have a hard time that we don't you know that that a lot of people have in the um, more you know respectable privileged white communities that they don't don't realize that they have and some of it i think comes out of this this sort of uh, spiritual core there's only sort of an archetypal or spiritual core so i want to talk a little bit about that towards the end okay so that's sort of my outline um let's talk about who she is okay so she's uh, an afro-brazilian spirit uh, she's evoked by practitioners of umbanda and kimbanda okay which are actually two similar but opposite religions one is more Catholic influenced, one is more black magic influenced. Uh, she is the consort of uh, Ishu, who is the messenger of the Orishas in uh, Candomblé, which is another religious tradition, Afro, sort of Afro-Brazilian uh, religious tradition. Really, um, I think the, I think Candomblé came uh, through the, um, you know, while there was the uh, Portuguese were, um, were dominant in, in that area in the 19th century. Um, she's known by many names, many avatars, um, and she's often associated with the number seven, crossroads, graveyards, spirit possession, and witchcraft. And we'll see the, the qualities that she has um, if I draw that line again between ancient religion and, you know, more modern ideas of religion. Now, of course, when I say modern, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, 300 BCE. That's not really very modern, is it? But what perhaps maybe at the beginning of the Christian era, the way that um, religions became, you know, more about good and evil, more about ethics and morality, and not so much about um, connecting uh, with the earth, with, the, with you know, with, with survival, with nature, 
um, with with having that relationship with nature, understanding what nature says to us, and um, trying to get on with the business of our lives uh, in the in the context of that. So there's there's a couple of uh, different uh, different things here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a. Um, I hope this dry cough does not does not permeate today. Um, okay. So while Ishu, um, the this the uh, husband of Pambagira. Uh, represents male sexuality, fertility, and strength. Pambagira personifies female sexuality, beauty, and desire. And she's depicted as a beautiful woman who is insatiable. Pambagira is venerated with great respect and care because of her reputation for possessing great wrath. She is often invoked in those who seek aid in matters of the heart and love. Uh, now here, interestingly, she's also noted for her connection with both transgender women and effeminate male worshippers, and is reputed to possess both. Okay, and that makes sense because she is. You will see her association with crossroads, which should remind you of deities like Hecate, for example. Um, there's that connection with the underworld. There's the connection with the dead. There's the connection with the ancestral. In short, you're talking about standing on the edge between life and death. Okay. And one thing about transgender people is that they are they are also liminal in their own way they're they're not it's 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 the fem, it's the threshold between masculine and feminine it's 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 both and it's neither at the same time um which is something that apparently really really rattles people um you know it, it, it which which is why i think the whole masculine slash feminine theme um is so interesting but um you know so, so she's definitely so. So we see her here as somebody who, um, in spite of her very strong femininity, she is about you know bursting those boundaries. So that um, is interesting. Uh, some representations of Pambagira display the characteristics of being promiscuous, talkative, and vulgar. Uh, however, she has many avatars and will be more or less inclined towards the behavior depending on how she manifests herself. Okay, so she has many avatars. Um, just a few of them. Um, Maria Malambo, yeah, it seems to be um, one of them. Uh, it's, uh, I just want to see if this is the one I'm, I'm thinking of. But there's an ascent, there's this kind of um, translation of her as um, the raggedy, ragged Maria, or Mary, or the ragged Maria, the Maria of the trash. Okay, she's, um, she's associated, this is another, another aspect of her, she's associated with the downtrodden and the marginalized. So with poor people, with prostitutes, with um, con men and criminals, okay? Definitely you see the trickster element here as well. If we're talking archetypes, we're talking about the archetype of the trickster, um, which can give her a reputation as being akin, and again, in, in religions that try to put a good and evil inflection on things, saying, oh, well, you know, the trickster is always evil. Um, you know, Satan as a trickster is often considered to be evil, you know, but, but it would be a mistake to interpret her that way. I mean, it's not that, you know, they, they're say, they're, what's been said about her is that um, when she, um, when she a appears or she appears as a possessing spirit, um, she's, there's, there's many things about her that um, may not be, might not be trusted. And this is actually true of any kind of spirit evocation um, or, or in a kind of invocation to, to possession or, or anything like that, which is not typical in... Um, what, what you see, at least what you see written in Western traditions, generally you have a spirit that, you know, stands outside of a circle, you know, in a triangle, you know, there's, um, there's this idea that you kind of keep the spirit separate. Um, there's a certain danger here because you have a spirit that actually um, can, can take over your body and possess you. Again, there's that very direct um, experience of the deity that you see in, um, in African religious tradition which again is similar to um, the very ancient uh, Dionysus worship and so forth, which is, the, which, which is probably the only example in um, ancient, you know, ancient Greece and pre-ancient Greece, really, what we think of as ancient Greece. Um, you know, this is where you have these experiences of these deity, you know, the, the possessing deity. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, kind of, it's a largely foreign concept even for a lot of Western religions. Um, and it tends to be misidentified as not being religious or as being, you know, belonging to some kind of black magic or superstition or something like that. But it is the expression or embodiment of these forces. And these forces, you know, you, you, the, the, the practitioner needs to be someone who is, um, 
you know, who's, who's able to, to handle that, who's able to um, be able to take that spirit in and to be able to manifest without it, um, without it destroying them. And from what I've heard from people who practice Kimbanda, um, that, you know, there, there, there's, um, there's an article here that I was reading on Kimbanda where they said, well, um, Ishu is very, um, you know, those rituals can be, you know, can be very intense, whereas the ones with Pambagira, because she's a woman, are, are less intense. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, not, not from what I've heard, um, you know, because uh, I, I had been at a talk that somebody gave a couple of years ago. It was a Kimbanda practitioner who said, you know, that when they, um, you know, <clears throat> did the ceremony to approach the, the spirit of Pambagira, that it was like she was like pick them up and throwing them around the room and like, you know, who the F do you think you, you know, <laughs> you think, you know, I'm going to show you, you know, she's not, um, she's not a gentle spirit. And um, it's, it's very funny how people want to associate femininity with that, that gentleness. And there are de fe feminine deities that do um, express that, but uh, Pambagira is not one of them. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we're going to talk more about those attributes in a little bit. So, okay, so the first thing, um, so let me just see what else I, I, I want to finish talking about, um, about her. Um, okay, Pambagira is an entity from the highly syncretic 20th century Brazilian Umbanda and Kimbanda traditions. Um, they're not, they're not the same religion, and, um, I would like to talk about each one separately in a moment. Um, but it says her origins are in the European wise women and in the Pan-African uh, Yami Osoronga, uh, both degraded as witches. But these have to do with these very powerful feminine figures. So again, I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to see because I have, I have so there's so many notes that I have on this. Um, so I think I think what I want to do before I go too far there is um let me jump back and let me look at let me talk a little bit about what umbanda and, and kimbanda are because i think i think understanding these religious traditions um you know is helpful in trying to understand who she is and what her role is okay so first if we talk about umbanda um umbanda has one supreme god known as olorum um and uh, many divine intermediary deities called orishas now the Orishas are, uh, again, tutelary spirits. Like we had talked about Maman Brigitte in the last podcast. Uh, these are intermediaries between the creator God and humans. So technically they are, they, they are treated as monotheistic religions. Um, but, you know, it, it becomes questionable. The monotheism becomes questionable when you have all these other interceding spirits. But it is a way in which these... Um, other traditions have managed to pull, um, you know, uh, have managed to mix uh, European religion with African tradition. So, you know, you're still keeping the, the, this um, nature spirit aspect of things. It's the spirits of, um, you know, of day-to-day -day life. And you, but you still have this creator who's sort of uh, remote. Now, what's interesting about that is that um, it, the... The, the, uh, one example you really see of this in Christianity um, is Christian Orthodoxy and also Catholicism, Catholicism in particular, because Catholicism has, um, you know, had sort of rigorously um, had a missionary aspect to it, you know, to, to save people, right? And it's easy to see why a religion like Catholicism would take hold, because, um, because it does have this idea of a remote creator God, but it also has a cult of saints who are intermediaries. So that, that all kind of fits together very nicely. If you have this idea of a remote creator, um, but then you have these immediate deities. And it's a way, it's a way of almost combining the imminent and transcendent thing. Um, you know, it's a way of dealing with it by having these intermediary spirits. And of course, in Christianity, again, you have things like angels or angelic messengers and, um, and other kinds of guardians. Uh, Ishu, I should note, is a is considered to be a guardian spirit or a guardian of the gate. So it's uh, so again, they, there's that there's that aspect that these are spirits that stand between this world and the other world. Um, now, the um, Umbanda tradition does not work in black magic at all. Um, they are very much they're very Catholic in their inflection. Um, there's a uh, the background of it. Okay, I'm just going to give you some background on Umbanda. Uh, it originated in South America, developed in the Portuguese Empire, 
uh, late 19th century Brazilian scholars criticized it, saying they were primitive and hindered modernization. Oh, well, excuse me. Heard that a lot. That goes back to that idea of progressive religion, um, which is idiotic. Um, so it was uh, on the other, at the same time, uh, this mentions uh, Alan Kardec's spiritism, a development of spiritualism creeds, was ex increasingly accepted by Brazilian urban middle and upper class with followers since 1865. Since that spiritism came from Paris with the upper classes, there was no integration with the lower classes. Um, <clears throat> the Kardecists, followers of the spiritism, were mainly middle class people of European descent, many pursuing military and professional careers. And they were, they were influenced by the philosophy of positivism, which aims to join religion and science, and actually failed pretty badly at that. Um, but uh, it says that on November 15, 1908, a group of Kardecists met at a seance in the neighborhood of Neves, um, Sao um, Goncalo, I hope I'm saying that right, city near uh, the federal capital, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And... Um, during the seance, um, there, there was a, you know, um, uh, a spirit that identified itself uh, as um, the half-Indian peasant of the seven crossroads. And uh, then he in, in incorporated another spirit, identified himself as uh, Father Anthony, a wise old slave that died after being savagely flogged by his master. Okay, so you kind of see where this is going. This is, um, this is this, you, you've got this kind of spiritualist tradition, okay, um, that ends up combining with these kind of Af African and Catholic elements. Um, and in some, some versions of uh, Umbanda, like Umbanda Esoterica, there's also uh, Eastern uh, influences like Buddhism uh, and Hinduism. Um, and it's, uh, and, and it, it, this, this, is a, this is a tradition that sort of appeals to middle class people, okay? Um, so it's it's a very um, again they 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 have these kinds of rituals that are very um, you know uh, that are very very similar to voodoo and santeria practices only there's no sacrifices in Umbanda. Um, what I wanted to see here was yeah they have um, a lot of their the deities a lot of the uh, orishas are sort of are well not sort of they are uh, syncretized uh, with Catholic saints. So Oshala um, is syncretized as Jesus, okay? Um, Shango is, is, uh, is syncretized as John the Baptist. Um, or Shango. Chango, I think that's Shango. Um, you have uh, Nana. Nana is syncretized as Saint Anne. Uh, and Ishu is usually synchronized as Anthony of Padua, okay? So the, you see that there's some of this um, Catholicism that is in Umbanda. Now, Pamba Gira and Exu in this particular um, tradition, um, <clears throat> they they mention um, Ishu as a as a phalanx of spirits that are adjusted to karma. They are messengers of the Orishas. They bring justice wherever it's needed. Okay, so here they're associated with justice, and you'll see why this is important in the other. Um, offerings are made in the small kalunga or cemetery or at a crossroads. Um, they are never intended to harm anyone. They don't use black magic or animal sacrifice. They protect people while they were on the streets, roads, nightclubs, etc., and protect them from evil spirits. Um, <clears throat> female issues are called pambagiras. Their action field is love, especially self-love, but also romantic relationships. But under no circumstances will they perform black magic. Um, pambagiras in this tradition, and like the issues, undo black magic that exists in Kimbanda. Now that's that's really interesting, okay? So it's it, it reminds me a little bit of the essence of Chamunda, who is also worshipped by the downtrodden and the outcasts and those who are on the margins of society. But at the same time, she's you she is she exists within Hindu tr tradition as somebody who um, also protects people from that. So it's it's almost it's like a two sided thing. They can they can cause that to happen, or they can. Um, undo, undo a you know an, an act of black magic or some kind of an evil act, as well as um, <clears throat> provide provide the energy or the impetus or whatever to do one. So they're not you know we're not talking about spirits that are necessarily good or evil. It's a matter of their inflection within the tradition. Now, um, now Kim uh, Kimbanda. Okay, first of all, it, around um, the late nineteenth century. Um, it, there, there uh, was something called Makumba, 
which was a pejorative term for all religions deemed by the white dominant class as primitive, demonic, or superstitious. Okay, so it was, it was a it was a negative term, and they and they put Umbanda and Kimbanda under the same umbrella. Now Kimbanda, of course, insisted that no, um, they were not the same as Umbanda. I mean, they are in. There's some aspects of them that are two sides of the same coin. They they may appeal to the same um, orishas, um, but um, Kimbanda has removed all Catholic element because Catholic element uh, in that in Kimbanda is is really the um, it's it's the it's it's the white influence I suppose you could say on the religion. So all of that has been removed. There are no appealing to any kind of saints in Kimbanda. And um, as it says here, <clears throat> Umbanda represented the whitened aspects of Macumba, drawing heavily on spiritual and hierarchical values of French spiritism and Catholicism. On the other hand, Kimbanda represented the aspects of Macumba rejected in the whitening process, becoming the Macumbas of Macumbas. Um, so, um, yeah, some believe that they represent aspects or tendencies of a single system. Others believe that Kimbanda and Umbanda have morphed into their own religions. Okay. So, so what actually happens then in, um, so how do, how do the, how do the rituals work in Kimbanda, in, uh, Kimbanda? Well, it says a classic Kimbanda ritual called, uh, Chabalo consists of several parts. A motive, a dedication to a spirit, a marginal location, like a crossroads or a cemetery, uh, metal or clay, earthy material, because this is an earth, um, this is definitely related to nature and to earth spirits and elemental things. An alcoholic drink, scent, and food, usually peppered flower palm oil mixtures, some call, sometimes called um, miyami miyami, um, and they give an example of, of one of these um, chabalos. Um, so this first one that's mentioned here uh, says, a work of great force under the protection of Ishu. Um, uh, I'm not going to say this right. Tranca Ruas das Almas, block street of the soul, streets of the block streets of the souls. Okay, I'm, I'm my Spanish is not any better than anything else. So, um, my French is actually pretty good. My Spanish isn't um, to eliminate an enemy. So it says, go to the crossroads of Ishu on a Monday or Friday near midnight, if possible, in the company of a member of the opposite sex. Greet Ogum with a bottle of light beer, a white or red candle, and a lighted cigar. Greet Ishu. Um, Sir block streets of the souls by opening seven bottles of rum in the form of a circle, lighting seven red and black candles and offering seven cigars. Put inside a vase and put this inside a vase and mix the following: manioc flour, palm oil, and peppers. Okay, here again we see pe we talked about maman Brigitte and the peppers, and this is um, the hot peppers are also part of the the offerings along with alcohol and cigars. Put on the ground in the center of the circle, name the person whom one wishes to harm, and using a knife, stab with this with violence, asking Ishu to attend to one's request. Okay, so that's one example of a of a kind of ritual. And it's pointed out that um, these uh, religions, you know, the beliefs that, that Kimbanda is actually meant to be a very practical kind of religion. It's not about um, attaining spiritual knowledge or it's about it's about dealing with day to day life. And because you're dealing with people who are on the margins. Um, that that that's more important. There isn't there isn't time to sit around and and contemplate. You know, not when not when you're when every day could be your last day. Okay, it, again, very similar to the Santa Muerte tradition um, and the popularity there. Because when you have a lot of people who are uh, downtrodden, um, they're not. You know, you're not talking about a group that's interested in obedience. You know, obedience to the uh, you know the white patriarchal order that's there and that's in place, or the religious system that that type of religious system um even if there's any kind of bar you know borrowings from it there's a sense of wanting to um establish one's own identity and do what one what one you know very aggressively do what one needs to do to survive or to um you know to assert their own sovereignty and their own power sovereignty is a real theme in these kinds of belief systems especially with the female figures um as we're going to see with Pambagira. Um, the idea, I mean, there's, there's been ideas, for example, with the Morrigan in Ireland or with Maeve, a idea of, you know, sovereignty, say, um, you know, say from England, Ireland, um, being their own nation or being, um, you know, they're sovereign in their own land. But there's also the idea of being sovereign over yourself. Okay. And this is a particular concern, not only for women, but also for people who tend to be people who are considered, um, 
of quote unquote of color. And I only say it that way because technically everybody, everybody's skin has a color, but we tend to think of darker skinned people as being of color. So, and they tend to be the ones who are marginalized. So it's easy to see why this kind of a system um, appeals to people who say, hey, I, I'm not going to be subject to somebody else for something like this. I, I'm going to retain my own sovereignty. Um, and again, that applies to both uh, aspects of being female, because females, of course, you know, the good female is obedient and, you know, you know, tends to her husband and is a nourishing, you know, um, you know, more passive. And uh, as we'll see with Pambagira, Pambagira has seven husbands and, um, and she doesn't take any crap from anybody. So, you know, she is a representation of that, you know, that sovereignty. And my life is here to be lived for fun. My life is not here to... Um, you know, to, to drag around and to suffer, but I must be obedient, and, you know, there's none of that, okay? So, okay, let me talk about uh, Candomblé, which is another related religion, okay? And it's been described as one of the major religious expressions of African dias diaspora. Um, anthropologist Paul Christopher Johnson stated at its most basic level, Candomblé can be defined as the practice of exchange with Orishas. Um, he defined it as a Brazilian redaction of West African religions recreated in the radically new context of a 19th century Catholic slave colony. And he characterized Santeria and Haitian voodoo as sister religions. Uh, there's no central doctrine authority in religion. In fact, Candomblé is exclusively about, um, it has more to do with practice because the, the name actually means dance in honor of the gods. And music and dance are an important part of it. And the practice is more important than any kind of doctrine, okay? Um, it, is, it is noted that it is very closely aligned with Umbanda, as both involve the worship of Orisha. Um, Umbanda is usually more open in public than Candomblé, with its religious songs being sung in Portuguese. There are some practitioners that engage in both. Um, a tariro that practices both refers to as um, Umbandamblé. <laughs> um, and there is... Uh, you know, it, it does, there is definitely, again, like, like with Umbanda, um, Candomblé is also has a, a lot of Catholic elements. And we also see the presence of um, Ishu and uh, Pambagira in this religion uh, as well. But again, there, the focus of, of Pambagira in these, in Umbanda and in, in Candomblé is more, has more to do with um, with love and you know the receiving of love. So you know, a, you know, a woman or a man who desires another person, you know, may appeal to the to the pambagira to find uh, to find love or to to try to attract a special person. Okay, um, but that said, um, you know, there's it, within Candomblé there's this idea that you have in a way kind of like with ancient Rome again when you had the lares or your household spirits or your or genius or your your particular spirit that is uh, associated with you in um, in Hinduism you might think of this as the ishta devata or chosen deity the one that you have a connection with okay it says people's li the problems that arise in your life are in interpreted as a disharmony in the relationship with your orisha okay and um and it does not, now, Candomblé does not have a duality of good and evil. It says each person is only required to fulfill his or her destiny to the fullest in order to live a good life, regardless of what destiny is. Um, however, it's not a free ticket to do whatever you want. It's the idea that bad actions will return to you, almost in the, in the kind of idea that we have about karma, the consequences of actions. Okay. Um, so, you know... Um, Okay, so I don't want to I don't want to go too far afield there, but I felt that it's important to kind of understand, you know, these religions, what's different about them, and what the relationship is between them, in order to understand the role of Pambagira, because she functions a little bit differently in these different traditions. And um, let me um, look back at this here. Uh, okay, now where does Pambagira come from? What what are her origins? Okay, so I mentioned this uh, ancestral belief in the awe-inspiring divine mothers called the, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, so apologies if I'm not, Awon Iyawa, um, which are these, um, and they possess the, the power Ajay, which is, again, this is this, is this, this is this divine feminine power, is known as Ajay. Um, so this was um, described as being in the ancestral period. So um, 
in the Middle Ages, there was this widespread belief in Galatian um, megas, or holy women, and bruxas, or, or bruxas, who are witches. And these were persecuted by the Inquisition um, in Spain and Portugal, because this is uh, definitely um, more of a, a Spanish tradition. Now, in traditional Africa, um, there was a, a type of ritual called the um, uh, Gelede spectacle. And again, I think I'm, I hope I'm saying that right, because the accents, because um, it could also be Gelade. I'm not, you know, with the way the accents are. Um, but they were performed again to appease the dangerous powder. Um, Aj of the powerful ancestral mothers. So you see that these are okay. We have this African tradition um, of of these women with these these kinds of powers, and these end up being interpreted in the Middle Ages um, in in Spanish traditions. We see this idea of the uh, the bruxas or these um, powerful witch women. Um, now, in the 1700s to the 1900s, it says the um, Galede festivals were held annually. In Salvador da ba um, Bahia, Bahia, I think, in Brazil, um, until the death of the third priestess of the um, uh, Casa Branca uh, Candomblé um, religious community, and then after these festivals, so so you see they're 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 trying to show where the um, the African ceremony um, to appease the Aje ends up uh, being mixed in with the. Uh, you know, the Portuguese and, and the Brazilian kind of tradition. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, that's where we see Pambagira first as an Umbanda entity, okay? And it was the 1920s when Umbanda started to appear in, um, in urban Brazil around Rio de Janeiro. And here Pambagira is described as a, uh, she's, um, yeah, as I, I think I had said this before, her origins are in the wise women um, in Iami Osoronga, um, who, again, were later degraded as witches, as well as in the god uh, Bombonjira, which is a Congo name for the Aruba trickster and mediator god Ishu. In contemporary Brazil, Pambagira is the female counterpart of Ishu and portrayed as a street woman with all her vices and strength, an epitome of the other. Okay, now that I think is important. She appears when Amanda initiates enter into trances embodying her. So we see this similarity to voodoo and other traditions where the way that one, um, when one has the ceremony, one experiences the god directly. Uh, this powerful figure has been identified with a female devil, but simultaneously is invoked for strength, protection, and support, as we said. She's a representation of a prostitute, an independent woman who has seven husbands and does not accept male domination. And it's interesting because, again, like the story I told, when you have a male Kimbanda initiates who invoke Pambagira, um, she's, she's not nice to them at all. Um, she's she's very much letting them know who's in charge, um, and, and who knows? Possibly because maybe that's that's an element. I, I think it's hard for men uh, because I don't I don't I think men are un, again are unconsciously conditioned in this idea that there's a certain thing that they're supposed to be, and I feel like those kinds of rituals would be designed towards undoing that in some fashion. But in order to un, I mean, but it's but it's undoing it in a very violent fashion. Um, to say, you know, um, which which can actually, you know, again, if, if it's a person who's a worshiper of Kimbanda and who and who understands and respects the forces they're dealing with, somebody who who was, if that happened to somebody from the outside who did not respect those forces, then they might see it as sort of a a demonic possession or as something um, something to be fought against. But that actually isn't the point. It goes back to the idea that your root power is is feminine. And that this power, I mean, there are masculine and feminine powers, but, but the core feminine power is not, it's not anything, you know, weak and simpering and passive and submissive. I mean, there are elements, there are ways to have power that involve those kinds of elements. Um, take, you know, if you look again, I, I refer to the uh, instance of martial arts where, you know, you, there's a Aikido, for instance, the whole martial art of avoidance, Okay you can have great power in passivity. So one does not want to, you know, everything does not have to be aggressive action or force. But it's not that men have one and women have the other. There is definitely this, this, this primal power that comes out of the feminine that we see here. Okay. Um, Pambagira is associated with transition in dangerous places such as crossroads, cemeteries, markets, beaches, and garbage deposit. In the case of Maria Malambo, uh, raggedy Pambagira, um, and also um, the, the Maria of the Trash they, they put as uh, Pambagira uh, da Lixeria. Um Again, I, hope, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, 
as well as with possession trances, advice giving, blood sacrifice, alcohol, and the colors red and black. She's a female trickster figure. The archaic trickster persona is present in myths and folk tales around the world. He or she is always an outsider and marginal character that cannot be trusted and is characterized by excessive behavior. Now, this does come from a Palgrave Macmillan book on this tradition. I'll give you the uh, citation for it um, at the end because I, you know, I, I have it at the end of this of my notes. Um, okay. And it says, uh, yeah, the, the, there's a synthesis of, of, of Pambagira. Uh, she was, quote-unquote, born as a transformation of Bombonjira, a Congo name for the Yoruba god Eshu, a mediator, trickster, and a phallic deity, into Bombagira and then Pambagira. An analysis of this name is revealing as Gira is the name of an Umbanda ritual and means action of circling in Portuguese, as well as path in Bantu. In, um, in Portuguese, Pamba means pigeon and is slang for the male sexual organs in the northeast and the feminine sexual organs in the south of Brazil. That's interesting. It has to do with sex either way. On the other hand, uh, for the Bacongo, Pemba is the white clay that cleanses and signifies the mountain of the dead. In Yoruba land, Nigeria and Benin, it symbolizes Obatala, the Orisha um, Funfun. In Brazil, Obatala corresponds to the Orisha god um, Oshala, identified with Jesus Christ. Pambagira may also be associated with the Awan Iawa, as we had mentioned, um, the powerful, awe-inspiring, and independent African ancestral mothers manifested in the Afro-Brazilian worship of female Orishas. Okay. And actually, I'm going to have another podcast on at least one of these other Orishas um, this coming up uh, this spring. So just, uh, just sort of mentioning that as a preview. Okay, um, so yeah, so again, this mentions the energy of Ajay, cosmic force that originates with great mother deities, often misunderstood as witch. It is a biological, physical, spiritual force of creativity and social and political enforcement. A vastly influential power that is inclined towards paradox and multiplicity, Ajay is embodied in the Awan Iyawa, um, Awan Yami Osoronga, as well as in certain persons of power. And again, I'm going to repeat this. If I'm really butchering this for people who know this religion, I apologize. I'm not going to butcher the names. I'm just trying to make my way through this here. Okay. Um, now, um, so they talk about the powerful ancestral mothers, um, also named Iyami, or my mother. Um, and then there's, there's some other permutations of that. They possess such a mystical and dangerous power, the Ajay, that they must be appeased in the Gelade spectacles through a satirical masquerade, okay? Um, which is interesting. That, again, that comes back to the idea that, um, that uh, Merch Eliad talks about, that when one performs these particular kinds of spectacles or rituals, that you are actually bringing yourself back to a particular sacred place and time at the beginning of things. And that it's in this space that you... Um, make contact or connect with these forces. Um, this uh, this idea of the sacred, rather than the idea that something can be done at anywhere at any time, there's definitely um, a sense of time and place uh, to these kinds of rituals. Now, Pambagira and her different avatars um, is a unique Brazilian creation. A female version of Ishu, and as such, is famous for being insatiable, promiscuous, vulgar, and talkative. Ishu is the messenger and mediator African god with characteristics of a trickster. His colors are also red and black, and his symbol is fire. Okay, so now we see this fiery aspect again. In Afro-Brazilian religions such as Candomblé, Ishu is the dynamic propelling principle responsible for communication. Now, isn't that interesting? Communication, and he's a trickster. This reminds us of Mercury or Hermaeus in the Greek and Roman. The Sorisha of destiny and the crossroads who opens the path for any enterprise is the first to be given reverence in any ceremony. In a way, that kind of reminds me of Ganesha or Ganapati in um, uh, Hindu religion, um, because you know one one honors Ganesha before they honor any other gods or the guru or, or anything else. Um, in Ubanda, issues are identified with spirits of particular persons from the past, and they are divided into superior and inferior, non-baptized, um, <clears throat> uh, and Pambagiras who are seen as demonic forces. Okay, so that's the way they're seen in um, Ubanda. Ishu spirits do the dirty work that the Orishas cannot perform and are considered their slaves, only obey the logic of the marketplace. Um, it also believes that every living being has their personal issue. Now, this is an Umbanda, okay? 
It says the multifarious Pambagira is one of the most powerful entities of the Umbanda religion. As a liminal being par excellence, Pambagira is strongly connected to marginality, ambiguity, sacred powers, transformation, and transmutation of matter, the passage from life to death, and vice versa. She may be accompanied by symbols of death. Um, and um, the liminality of her is both spatial and temporal as she's linked to the outskirts and the transition between day and night. And it reflects the social marginalization of large groups of her devotees in Brazil. She's connected to blood and regeneration, sometimes requiring blood sacrifice. In addition, she is linked to possession trances, usually performed by women during which the mediums speak. Pambagira is connected to human sexuality and love as well as to blood death, thus containing the life cycle. Okay. So again, we have this idea of um, the life cycle itself uh, as being embodied in the feminine. Now that now I have a curious association here because I think about the idea of um, the serpent as representing the cycle of life and death. Uh, because the snake sheds its skin, it's like it's a it's a death and rebirth kind of a thing. And I've noticed that in Western religion, anything connected with the life cycle is considered to be evil. And, it, it, and it, so I, I go back to the Gnostic, uh, the Cathars, and their whole idea that all material life, anything that's not spiritual, is evil. Uh, something condemned as a heresy by the Catholic Church. But um, it's interesting how that idea still kind of takes hold, that anything having to do with the world, with the, the, the quote-unquote the flesh, or the enjoyment of the flesh, is somehow wicked. And that's an idea, these, these, I feel like these beings are so very important because that to me, that's just, it's just garbage. I mean, it's, you know, I, I understand the reason that people should not go to excesses to destroy themselves and so forth, but the idea that you can't have fun and can't enjoy your life is just ridiculous. I mean, we, we are just, we are just trained that our lives all have to be about discipline and about suffering. Now, it's not that we shouldn't have, you know, there's, there's that old adage that um, in order to be free, you one has to experience limitation. There is, there is that, but there's this idea that somehow we're just not allowed <clears throat> to be happy. Like somehow we, we need to be ashamed of the fact that we're here and that we're alive. And it's an unconscious thing. And there'll be people who say, oh no, but it's like, yeah, but you're only supposed to find joy in things that are sober and respectful. And those things are boring. I mean, <laughs> it's not that, you, I suppose you could find, you know, there's people who do find joy in that, but, but there's a lot of people who don't. And, and, you know, and so what ends up happening is that those, those elements of ourselves end up coming out perhaps in inappropriate and harmful ways rather than being allowed an expression. Um, Carl Jung talks about this when he said, you know, we talked about the, 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 in, the insane carnivals that they used to have in the church, which represented, uh, which were a carryover from the, the Bacchanals or the Dionysian festivals, which were also expressions like that, where people went out and ate and drank and had orgies and went nuts. And, you know, it was just... Um, it was a specific time set aside to put the rules aside and to let the lower classes take over, um, in particular. I mean, it was always associated with people who were considered to be marginalized, and they were the ones in charge. Um, this is, of course, why the state always wanted to be very controlling of these, because it's like, all right, all right, we'll allow, we'll allow some time. But see, then eventually the church decided to take all of that away and said, no, no, all, you know, all these days and these days should be no more carnivals. It should be days for sober reflection and... As Jung says, he says, well, he says, in doing this, they threw the gates to hell wide open. Because now, all of these particular forces, because as they say, everyone has their own issue, um, all of these forces are part of us. And when you do that, now, now you're in a situation where you can't, um, you know, you're in a situation now where, you, where now, you know, now you've decided... Um, that you have to be a good, virtuous, and moral person, and you push a lot of that to the side. So instead, the way that that comes out is very, very unconsciously. And it's not unless somebody tells you, hey, you know, you say this, or you do this, or whatever, you know, you're, you're usually not aware. And you may say, oh, no, you know, not, not me, there's nothing wrong, Just, I have no, you know, negative intentions, I don't do this, I don't do that. But... But it does eventually bubble to the surface. I feel like that's what's happening, not just in the U.S., but in the world. I mean, you're, you're seeing people who are, you know, decent, kind, respectable people, <clears throat> you know, um, and you're just seeing some of these things bubble out, some of these, um, this rage and this hatred and this fear, and you're kind of going, what the, what the actual, and <clears throat> none of it really seems to make any sense, and we're, we're trying to figure out why, why would this, why is this happening? How do people not see that this is like an infection? Um, so 
I have a little battery that keeps um, trying to come over here. Um, but, you know, so, but they don't because they're so blinded to the idea and they think, you know, like, no, I'm a good person and I represent, you know, you, you, this is why I'm saying you have to blow up that kind of thinking. Um, and that is kind of what's happening here. There's like this blowing up of things where you need to, in order to really, um, to get to really living life, to enjoying life, experiencing life and, um, you know, being able to have any kind of sort of equality among people or, you know, the equal chance for people to enjoy and experience life, you have to break those kinds of boundaries. Um, and, you know, this, this is what I see here is this kind of representation of these forces um, that will take over unconsciously if you don't give them proper respect and proper attention. And that is, this, again, just to reiterate, this has sort of been my point all along about the Dark Mothers. These are not, these are not deities to be put aside, repressed, exorcised. These are, these, are de these are forces to be reckoned with in some fashion in your life. Whether, you know, at the very least, you should show them respect. Um, but, they are, but they are the forces that if you embrace them, these are actually the forces of the, of the power and potential of your own life. Um, and, and your ability to live life, um, and to enjoy life, and to be happy, um, because a lot of times we just, we just think we're, you know, <clears throat> you know, we're chugging along from one challenge to the next, and, um, you know, we feel like this is, you know, as Alan Watts said, we, you know, we, lots of people who go jogging all the time, and he says, you know, and they're, they're all worn out, and they're exhausted and everything, but, but, but they think it's good for them, you know, and, you know, not to say that there may not, again, there are not benefits to be reaped from discipline and so forth, but, um, but too often um, the, the sheer enjoyment of life is just put aside as something um, devilish or something um, like it's a vice or it's a weakness. And, um, you know, and here you see this happening and, you seem, and it only seems to be connected with this marginalized community, you know, the criminals, prostitutes, people who uh, live on the edge, uh, poor people, outcast people. Because these are people, again, with nothing to lose. So um, they might as well be free in the way that they can. Because the society around them does not make them free. It tries to make them subject. So um, it, it's a side note there, but it, but it develops the idea that I think about, you know, w with regard to these kinds of deities and their function. Okay. Um, okay, Pambagiras, together with issues such as... Um, <clears throat> Uh, Ze uh, Pelintra represent uh, the pova darua or street spirits, usually malandros, con men, and prostitutes. They dress in red and black, colors of the Orisha Ishu, although white may also be used. In Umbanda, they are considered quote unquote lower or non evolved spirits. I really hate that phrasing. Um, spirits of darkness or of the left. Okay. Again, more of this split thinking which, uh, you know, really, who can evolve by practicing charity, which means giving advice to devotees. Now, this is also something that is characteristic of people who practice, um, you know, who invoke, who do evocations of demons in Western practice, because the whole idea is that by giving the demon an opportunity to serve you, you can evolve it in some way. And I don't know, I, I'm not, <laughs> I'm really not sure what, how I feel about that way of thinking about it, because... I don't know that we're any more or less evolved than, than anything else, but um, I'll just leave that aside. I won't get into that uh, track. Um, it's not surprising to find the voiceless persona of Indians, old slaves, children, and tricksters as the main types of Umbanda entities as they reflect the marginality of their worshipers. Okay. Um, so um, this, uh, this particular article I'm looking at goes on to talk about how Pambagira is... It, you know, doesn't it, Umbanda doesn't deal with death or salvation of the soul, but they say it's a religion of life concerned with the manipulation of daily reality. And a lot of these ceremonies are designed to help um, heal physical ills, emotional ills, spiritual ills, because these people often are people who don't have the money to go to the doctor or can't afford certain cures or, you know, can't go to a therapist or, or whatever. So this becomes the substitute for that. And um, these disorders of reality, and sometimes it's that, you know, they're being oppressed by somebody and the, um, you know, the, uh, the practitioner of, you know, well, particularly in Kimbanda, you know, you can, you can curse that person or get them out of your life in some, in some fashion. Um, but, 
it's the idea that somehow this can be remedied or, or rebalanced in this way. Um, now, she mentions that the lim liminality of Umbanda entities such as Ishus and Pambagiras bestows them with unusual power. Their dwelling places are the street, the crossroads, the market, and the cemetery, places of transition, ambiguity, and insecurity, which nonetheless they know how to operate. This is opposite to the privileged sectors of society, for most of which these places are off limits. They are only places of transition, not their dwelling places. Where people in certain occupations, such as street vendors, prostitutes, taxi drivers, policemen, drug dealers, and thieves, also dwell in these places, and they often seek the aid and protection of these special entities. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, she goes on to talk about the different types of families of Pambagiras in Brazil, okay? And I'm not going to list them all because there are a ton of them. Um, but, but, but she is, no, as I said, she is known by many, many, many different names. It has to do with, um, she had the seven cemeteries of the fig tree, of the gate, of, um, of the sepulchre, of the, um, you know, the gypsy, of the cemetery, of the souls, lady of the night, sorceress. There's all kinds of um, epithets, I suppose, for uh, Pambagira or for the, this, this group of uh, entities known as Pambagiras, okay? Because as I mentioned, you know, sometimes it, it, it's often, it's not clear that she's an, a distinct entity, but rather a, a, a type of entity, um, a, type of, a type of feminine spirit. Which makes sense, because why, why should there only be one, right? Um, and she also mentions, a proto, she's a prototype of a prostitute, embodies transgressive femininity, is sexually independent, unsubduable. She's the antithesis of a docile and maternal housewife. Um, according to one Umbanda Panto Cantado, or ritual song, she is the wife of seven husbands. Do not provoke her. Pramakira is dangerous. Okay. Um, now, she also talks about the mediums who... Um, embody the spirit of Pambagira, um, and that these women may use their role as mediums to raise themselves up in situations where they are considered to be the lesser or to fight against abusive husbands. Um, she mentions a particular case, which is really interesting. Um, let's see. Um, I, I have it here. Um, yeah, here we go. Okay. There's, um, they, the, this author mentions a particular example in a judiciary case occurring in Rio de Janeiro in 1979 to 1981 that was brought to the public sphere by press articles in which Pambagira was accused of inciting a woman to commit a crime against an abusive and impotent husband. In this homicide case, the person incorporating Pambagira Maria Padilla, as well as the wife of the victim and two other accomplices were judged in court and sentenced to 14 to 20 years in prison each. Going the experts called to help and solve the case were an Umbanda uh, Peda Santo, or priest, a Pentecostal minister, and a psychiatrist. Similarly, Kelly Hayes in her book Holy Harlots brings up an unresolved murder case in which the reader can infer that the victim was eliminated by the medium possessed by Pombagira because that woman was the medium's husband's lover. Okay. Um, so she says, um, as a threshold persona, Pambagira lives on the fringes of society in a contrasting universe, and therefore her transgressions and carnivalizations are uncontrollable. She recuperates her ancient connection to the untamed forces of passion, sexuality, blood, and death of mighty ancient female deities and their representatives. Okay. Um, and they said, they mention a line, she mentions a line from an ancient Yoruba myth, mother that kills her husband yet pities him which reinforces Pambagira's ambivalence. Her strength springs from her lowermost status, from her all-encompassing duality, from the fact that being an outsider frees her from imposed social rules and she is able to escape. Okay. Um, so, um, what I find very interesting about this, okay, because this was, this was the last point I wanted to make, and that had to do with the idea of uh, the racial overtones of this, because we both know that people who are from, um, you know, Latin, Latin American cultures or Spanish cultures frequently, um, as well as people, you know, people, of, you know, certain people from the Middle East, people from Africa, people who are darker skinned, who are not white people. So, you know, so to speak, although some, some might be white. Um, but it's, it's this idea of the Spanish or the African um, as being marginalized in a world um, where, you know, where the white person, the Caucasian white person dominates. And 
one of the things I have talked about is the fear of the feminine, but here I think we also can see this this when we talk about this Ajay, this this um this intense earth power that's embodied in the African religions. Um, you know, the intense power of the woman. That to me is is almost doubly threatening because you know, you're not coming from a culture where um obedience is stressed, where um where necessarily um, the comforting motherly aspect is stressed. Um, I mean, it, it might be in certain situations. I'm not saying it's it's completely absent, but it's like there's a there's a tremendous fear of that particular that force. Okay, this this sort of ancestral force that um, that has to be appeased through blood sacrifice, and it goes back to what I've said about when people would talk about, well, the days when there was the peaceful religion of the mother goddess. I was looking at Robert Graves again in front of the class I'm teaching, and I thought, oh, God, you know, um, you know, there was the day of the great goddess, and everything was peaceful until all those men came in and with their warlike ways. It's like, it, it, this, that story just gets on my nerves, and because, because this is it, that root feminine is not, it's not a, um, it's not a pleasant power. It has to be appeased through blood sacrifice. In in some in a lot of these ancient cultures, that's the way she was appeased. Kibbele cult and um, you know men men castrated themselves in the cult of Kibbele. Um, it was not um, the worship of the Earth Mother. The Earth Mother has to do with sexuality, with death, and with that very, that real intensity of emotion. Um, even in ancient Greeks, uh, uh, in the Greek myths. Gaia is somebody who expresses a tremendous amount of rage, you know, when, um, when Zeus, uh, uh, you know, um, wreaks all this havoc uh, on the earth and, you know, destroys, you know, she, she ends up bringing forth the monster Typhon, okay, to, uh, to battle him in the, in the Gigantomachy. I mean, that's the expression of the rage of Gaia. You're, you're not talking about something, and of course, then you have these kinds of figures, these dragon figures or these figures that, like serpent figures that represent life, is suddenly now becoming something suspect, evil, something has to be kept under control. Um, you know, and unconsciously, I feel like this is why people feel things like female sexuality have to be under control. It's this, it's this, this force that's associated, and, you know, and, and it's not surprising that it's associated with blood. Again, think about women and their menstrual cycles. That that's, that's the evidence of your femininity is when you start, or not, I shouldn't say your femininity, of your, when you become a woman is when you start to menstruate. Okay, and and also similarly, Pambagira has a lot to do with um, those who are um, on the edge in terms of gender. So it's not just about women and women's power; it's about the power of the liminal. It's about being on the edge, and and she's and she's represented by a feminine power because you know you're both. You're you're neither. It's not that you're in a particular role. You're you're both masculine and feminine. It's not about um, you. Um, having to, oh, well, you were born with this kind of a thing, so we're, you're expected to behave this way. Or if you were not born that way, um, well, now there's something wrong with you and we're going to marginalize you. You know, it's it's about breaking away from all of that and um, recognizing that all elements of both masculinity, femininity, uh, the, what you want to call, think of as good and evil, dark and light, all of it exists within everyone and everything. Basically, the way whether you see it as good or bad depends on how it affects you, you know, on your subjective inflection there. And it's not inherently, it's not any, it's, it's all of those things. And when you stop trying to, to split things, trying to control things about, you know, am I a good person or a bad person? Oh, I did this. I shouldn't do this. Oh, I had this feeling or thought I shouldn't have that. Um, it, when you break out of that, then you have, there's a freedom there because now you are who you are. And a lot of times what we have is, you know, pent up as, as rage or frustration or of all of these things are, are a result of what we feel is, is marginalized within ourself. And it's not always what we think it is. Um, for example, if you see men who are very, um, say, uh, very enraged or um, very misogynistic towards women, um, a lot of times that just reveals a deep hurt or a deep fear of some kind of feminine energy, energy like that, and rather than battling that energy and rejecting it, they would actually do well to embrace it, because that would, you know, if they feel impotent, which is usually what causes that, in, in some level, even if it's psychologically and not physically, um, they gain, gain a tremendous amount of power from embracing that. So it's, 
you know, so, so again, we're back to this kind of thing of this, this, this dark feminine force that represents, it can represent rage, it can represent violence, it represents sexuality, it can represent death, and, but it also has to do with the enjoyment of life, and my whole point is that in the West, we need to get away from the idea that this is all representing the forces of, of something evil, or something that should be avoided. Um, you know, it, it's always incumbent on the person to remain in their center and remain balanced, but that doesn't mean that you eliminate these things from your life, okay? And, um, you know, and Pamba Gira represents that aspect, you know, that terrifying aspect of the independent woman with her own sovereignty. Um, but instead of being afraid of it, maybe people just need to get used to it, okay? Uh, that's all I'm going to say for this week. Um, as usual, um, thank you for listening. Oh, I did want to give um, credit here. Um, a lot of what I've... Um, Pulled on Pambagira comes from Fierce Feminine Divinities of Eurasia and Latin America by, let's see if I get her name right, <coughs> excuse me, um, Malgorzata Oleskowitz uh, Para Paralba. I think that's how you say her name. Uh, that's why I couldn't just remember her name off the top of my head. Um, but it's her book, which came out from Paul Grave Macmillan in 2015 and in 2018. Okay. So uh, I'm going and I'll put a reference to that as well um, in the description and also, you know, both on YouTube and, you know, for the, for the podcast itself. So, um, you know, so that will be a book to check out if you would like to learn more about, about Pambagira and about this, uh, these religious traditions. Um, that's it for me. Um, I would, if you can check, if you want to check out uh, other work that I've done, please visit Cathonia.net. If you would like appointments with me, because I do deal very specifically with people's transitional issues, um, you know, through through my own method of trying to help people identify what's going on in balance. I don't I don't make any claims to be able to fix anybody or cure anybody because that's never that should never be the case. So that's something that's work you have to do. But um, my role is often to help people identify um, where they need to work and what they need to maybe what they need to pay attention to to affect their own uh, transition. And that you can you can check that out at liminalreiki.com because I have it where I, I have a video describing what my system is, and then I have um, all of, all options and descriptions of what I do laid out there. Um, I have uh, three books out. I have Death and the Maiden: um, The Curious Relationship Between the Fear of the Feminine and Fear of Death, uh, which is out from Algora Publishing, came out in 2019. So that, that's available. I have a link to that on Cathonia.net, as well as the two other fiction books I've produced that are also on these dark feminine, um, or on, on these ideas about uh, femininity and, and um, you know, the, the way in which it gets um, warped or, or repressed or turned around. Uh, one is called Maeve, M-E-D-B, and the other one is called The Morrigan Timelines. So you can check out the descriptions of both of those are there as well. Um, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Cthonia. So if you're interested in supporting my work, I would very much appreciate that. Um, and you can check that out there. And also, if nothing else, check me out on social media, subscribe, um, you know, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to YouTube channel, YouTube channels, Cthonia, everything else is Cthonia podcast. Um, two words on Facebook, one word on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, that's it for this week. See you next time.